Hoople's Cat. I'm going to talk about burns today and burns care, first aid care in conditions of sudden SHTF or long standing SHTF. What exactly are you going to do? Regardless of the depth of the burn, the treatment is always the same. If it is an SHTF, if there is an ice storm happened in your area and power is out, if a nuclear war has started, whatever the cause of the outage, those people who wear jewellery on their fingers and wrists, get it off. Get it off before the burn. If you have got any jewellery on, including wristwatches, get it off. There will be constriction, there will be swelling, and it's not a great idea to have rings on because as it swells, you may lose circulation. The other thing you want to do right away is to remove the source of heat. Now it depends why you've been burned. If you've been burned because there's a fire, get away from the fire. If you've been burned because fluids are on you, get the clothing off. A lot of people will go straight to the taps. That's a good idea. But if you have clothing, especially plastic clothing that's partially melted or fully melted, get it off. Now, as I've said before, actually removing it's going to remove some of the skin. People tell you not to do that. The heat of the clothing, if the clothing is still hot, get it off, even if you have to use a quick knife blade to slice through some of the skin underneath. Any residual heat is still going to go into the tissue and cause thermal burns. So if you have running cold water, place the limb under running cool water. Now people argue about the time for that, I would say 5 to 10 minutes, pull it out, look at it, put it back in. The reason I want to do it 5 to 10 minutes is I want to see what's going on there. I want to assess the severity of the wound, the injury. Having cooled it off for a prolonged period of time, now with a severe burn, I would say half an hour to an hour is the minimum time you're going to keep this emerged in cool water. If you don't have running water, have a 5 gallon bucket and put the limb into the 5 gallon bucket and pull it out, put it in. Pull it out. Keep an eye on the temperature of the five gallon bucket. A severe, a really deep severe burn could actually in fact raise the temperature of the water. You want cool water, not frozen, but cool water. So that's the other thing. You don't want people good intentions coming and putting direct ice or frozen cold packs directly onto the wound. They can actually cause necrosis tissue death by their temperature gradient being too much for the body to compensate for. Cold water. Having dealt with the burn by removing it from heat so there's no further burning and then cooling it down so internal temperature is reduced significantly to prevent any further burning and also to reduce swelling, at least initial swelling. The third thing you're going to do is you're going to cover it up. Now this is where it gets interesting. So you're in your apartment building and the power's been out for 12 hours, there's been a huge ice storm and you know from the news reports there's a lot of problems driving around and stuff and you're making yourself a can of soup on top of a candle rocket stove that you've built because you're a prepper and you haven't been paying attention and the candle has spilt and you burned yourself with the candle wax and overreacted and flipped boiling liquid all over your five layers of t-shirts you're wearing to stay warm. Initially you're not going to feel anything. Get them all off. Get them all off down to the skin. If there's any suggestion that you actually have had skin burn, even if it looks fine, cool water. So what are you going to do next? Well, you've cooled it down, you've removed the heat, you've dealt with possible fire, because you don't want the candle to catch fire and make the burn much more likely. Having dealt with all of that, what are you going to do? Well, you probably, if you have normalcy bias, going to call 911. Most people are going to think, this is not life-threatening. They're not going to come for hours, what am I going to do? So having called 911 and you get a busy signal and then eventually the answer and they say we'll be there when we can and we're facing significant delays, if you can get yourself to an emergency please do so, etc, etc. So what you do, you cover it. So that's the other thing. So most people are going to have kits like this. This would be the minimum size kit you would have in your home. Okay, this is a minimum size kit. It's a commercial kit with a few things added. So right off the bat, like I always tell people, I have forceps and I have sterile gloves. You don't need sterile gloves, you have to have gloves if you're treating other people and it's a good idea to have gloves. You can always put just cheap general latex gloves on the outside. The reason it's on the outside is that I don't want to open this up and have my hand, which has been all over my casualty or myself, go into it. And when you open it up, you want to have it open in such a way that you can open it quite quickly and easily with one hand. You may only have one hand. This one, as I said, is a commercial one, so it actually has burns material on it. If the area of burning is bleeding, 
open this up and directly put quick clot into that and leave it. Don't do anything else. After you've cooled it down, do that. Next thing you're going to do is you want to cover it up. Now, a lot of people are going to try and use stuff like this after burn. Be very careful putting anything directly onto the burn site. I have a burns kit, which I've got stuff that I can put into the burn that's sterile and cool. This sort of stuff I would avoid using until you know what you're doing with it. You don't put anything oil-based whatsoever into any area of the body that is not got intact skin. A lot of people have something like this. This is a hemostat, so I can make a very useless but quick tourniquet if I need it. I also have a tourniquet available if I need it. So your priority here is to remove the source of heat, cool the burn area down to normal temperature and make sure it's not rising by continually putting in cold water and then cover it up. Stop the bleeding, cover it up. So most people have things like Israeli dressings. This would be completely useless for anything that was even a minor burn upwards. It's too big, it's too thin, it's not really going to do the job you want it to do, it's got a specific job and this is not for it. When you on a frequent basis go through your first aid kits, put them back together the way you found them. Put them where you expected them to be. Now you may have something like this. This would be the front layer of the first layer of the burn, a uh, sterile seaweed based mesh or even a gel on that mesh, which is probably more likely what people will have. Now I know I'm not going to the emergency department because I'm not driving this too far driving. I know the ambulance services will eventually show up but it'll be a while. So rather than just cool and cover, before I cover I'm going to treat any bleeding areas with clot suppressant, either powder or a gel or a dressing, and I'm going to flick any areas of debris, dirt, contamination out as much as I can. If I have sterile salt water available, I'll pour that all over there as well using a syringe to squirt underneath any areas of holes. I want to get it as sterile, as empty of germs as I can prior to covering it. Now what do you use to cover it? This will be the biggest problem for most preppers. You're going to be limited. You can have something like this, a triangular bandage. If it's sterile or very clean, you can use this as your inner layer. And there's no reason because it's a triangular bandage like this that you can't just wrap it around and use it as a wrapping gauze. No reason at all. Having done that, you might then want to use something like this to lightly compress around the wound, knowing that the wound's going to swell. But what do burns do? Burns ooze. They ooze a ton of fluid. So having covered it up, you find that it's inadequate. Almost as soon as you put the layer on, it becomes sodden and moist. And it's a nice idea to keep it dry. So one of the things people will have available, I would say, and an extreme case is something like this. This is sterile gauze. There's four or five of them. If you open up the sterile gauze like this, so you can rip the gauze open, but if you do, make sure nothing on the outside of the packaging goes inside. But generally speaking, you'll find a little plastic area like this. Now, I don't have sterile gloves on, but I want to keep the wound contaminant, the stuff touching the wound as sterile as possible. If I open it up like this, gently, keeping my hands away from the inside. And I would say practice this. When I press down here, I'm not touching the inside, and I get hold of the dressing material, and I have it like this. And doing this means that it is pretty much sterile. Now this is a fairly bulky dressing for most people. With a major burn, this will get soaked through in like seconds to minutes. Okay, so what do they use in hospitals? You should have a supply of these, you can get them. They're called ABD pads, which is short for abdominal pads for compressing. They're designed for big wounds. Again, you should have a sterile area, you should have sterile gloves, you should have sterile forceps, you should put all of this stuff on the sterile tray. I have done a few videos on that. You don't have that, and you've burnt yourself and you're on your own, and help's not coming for hours. Again, non-touch technique. So open it up without touching the inside, place it on the wound, gently remove it, hold that. This is contaminated, this is not. So I would then move it to there and place it like this, because this is contaminated, this is not. But I don't want the contaminated side ever, that's fine, but I don't want the contaminated side ever to do this. Okay, sterile to sterile. So that's a much bigger wound dressing. 
Uh, it's an abdominal pad, it's designed for belly wounds, stuff like that. It'll hold quite a bit of blood before it needs to be removed. These are for the operating room for the regional burn centre, and these are a lot easier to use. Now, if you have something like this available, when you open it up, you've got already washed hands, right? When you pull it out, it actually has a sterile field around it. So when you actually pull the sterile field, and there's various ways of doing this, but basically you open it away from yourself, on the surface, like this. So I can now use the inside of this up to about two inches from the side of the wrap as a sterile area. And I can put lots of other equipment, carefully non-touch technique, dumping it inside. So this is what you would get in the operating room. Now I think you can immediately see the difference here. Multiple layers of, of sterile cotton. You can open it up, you can spread it around, but it's designed to really soak a pile up. Now I also have this type of dressing available. This is also a Burns dressing and it tells you how to open it. To open, place thumb snap at corner of bag. Well, where's the corner of the bag? There's the corner of the bag. And that doesn't work. So again, if you have equipment you don't know how it works, I've never really opened one of these, I would just use scissors right across. There's a way of opening it. So let's have a little look. So trying to open it, I've already contaminated this, and you don't want to do that. So have a think about your gear. Is it fiddly to open? It's a snap, you have to pull up and pull. So again, non-touch technique. If I wanted to, I can put this in the sterile field. Anything in the sterile field that I don't want in there, without touching the other stuff, I can just grab it and remove it. So this is a fairly chunky dressing. Now all of these burns dressings can be used for any major serious bleed. But this is a huge big pad. And the inside sterile and I put it in and wrap it around. Now for massive body burns in SHTF they're going to die unless you can get them to a major hospital. In SHTF this is not going to do much for you. But if you have a full length, full arm, half a face burn, something like this, just lightly put on like this, will actually absorb a huge amount of fluid. So here we go. With the alginate dressings, you need to keep them on. Don't remove them. Remove them maybe once a day. If you have to replace the dry dressings on top of it every one to four hours, do so, but leave the inside surface unaffected. The reason being you're not going to have much supply of stuff. Now what do you do if you don't have these big pads? One of the things you can do, of course, is you can have cotton sheets that are not dyed, and you can cut them up, make sure there's no threads on them. You can put them into a dry masonry jar and you can sterilize them and keep them in the jars to open them for this type of an emergency. The Burns dressings are going to have to be a lot bigger and thicker than what you're normally storing. Now Burns nursing care involves a lot of sterile equipment. It also means keeping the temperature quite high, like about 25-26 centigrade in the room, because you don't actually want the person to get hypothermic. They're going to lose a lot of fluid, they don't have the normal barrier, they're going to get cold quite easily after the initial period of cooling the burn down. So actually the emergency survival markets are good for that. The other things you might want to consider is put them on prophylactic oral antibiotics while they can swallow. Now I'm specifically not talking about nasal and oral burns or lung burns at this point for obvious reasons. The other one you want to do is you want to hydrate them. This is where Gatorade comes into its own. Give them lots and lots of fluid. Make them drink lots and lots of fluid, preferably with lots of calories in it. You might want to consider liquid versions of protein. They're going to lose a lot of protein over the next few days. When you take the dressing down, any black areas, you want sterile scissors and you want to cut the black areas away. Do not leave the black areas there. That's called Eshka and it will interfere with the healing process. You want raw, slightly bleeding pink flesh. That's what you want. Initially what you're going to get is lots of black, lots of yellow, lots of problems. The reason I'm saying put them on oral antibiotics is get them on it early before they actually get a wound infection. Wound infections are very common with burns. It can lead to something called sepsis. In SHCF or before major hospital treatment, that will kill them. 
the bigger the burn is, the worse it's, the outcome is going to be. So for that's one of the reasons that I talk about uh, having the ability to gently and legally end your own life or other people's lives in a condition of grid down. You don't want somebody to be in absolute screaming agony for three to four days until they finally die. I don't think that's a good outcome. I don't think that's good prepping. Other people disagree with that, but that's fine. But that's just my personal opinion. If the dressing is overwhelming, if the burn is incredibly deep, there isn't going to be no end point in an SHCF other than death. So this is much the same as carrying a tourniquet on you if you're using a chainsaw. Like you don't want to have to go into the house or go to the car kit to get a tourniquet if you're using a chainsaw. But you don't want to have to use the tourniquet because you're using a chainsaw. Do things slowly, deliberately, carefully. Turn things off. Be very careful using power tools. Be very careful when handling any fluids that are approaching the temperature of boiling. You want to be very, very cautious. If you're handling lye, trying to make soap, be aware of the fact that that can burn you quite severely before you ever notice. If you're mixing concrete up for a house project or you're mixing concrete up to make a, a bunker, be very careful about exposing your skin directly to the concrete. Lots and lots of normal things can cause severe burns. You don't want to have to treat a severe burn, either now, when everything's available for you, or in grid down. It's not a good idea. But you do want to have dressing materials available that will do the job if you fail or if you've been unlucky and you get a severe burn. So what am I going to do with all of this? Quite literally and quite simply, I'm actually going to put it back into these packets and I'm going to put it away for storage to be reused in the future. It isn't sterile, but it's clean and it can go on the outside. So most of the dressing material would be external to the wound. There would be a layer of something sterile between this and the wound. Sterile gowns a good idea if you're actually going to be spending a lot of time in the room with the person, but again, Ingrid down, this type of product is a great idea for various reasons, including pandemic moving around and stuff like that, or chemical attacks. But in frankly, what you need to do is get a whole bunch of white cotton sheets, cut them up into strips and squares, put them in canning jars, sterilize them, and leave them. You want to have the material available. Once you've used them on the person, consider washing them, hang them in the sunlight for a long time, and then re-sterilize them in the canning jars. In grid down, there is no single-use products. In modern life, pretty much everything is single-use. And that will trip us up in a condition of sudden SHCF, the fact that we just actually have rubbish and we throw it away. Nothing in SHCF would be single-use. This would now become writing paper, or it would become fire tinder. Well, I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, a few people did suggest to me various methods of actually spraying stuff onto uh, wounds that actually relieves the pain. I'm not actually going to put them up because I think you should do your own research on this topic. I'm not actually keen on anything going into a wound unless it's a prescribed medication from a doctor for any type of a burn. And I know a lot of people out there, especially in the States because of the price and availability of healthcare, are actually doing a lot of home medical care, which is not necessarily the best. I don't want to recommend anybody does that. This advice, this video was specifically about SHTF, not necessarily nuclear war, could have been an ice storm like they had in Texas where you've got a prolonged delay getting to an emergency department or an ambulance coming to you and the burn is significant enough that the first three or four hours of care that you can do at home can make the difference between having it heal up very well and not healing up at all. But feel free in the comments below to actually put in any suggestions you have for burns care, what you think I did right, what you think I did wrong. You've got to be very, very aware of the fact that the last thing you want to have to do is try to figure out what you've got in your first aid kits if you're faced with a sudden calamity. That is not the time to actually start rooting through your first aid kits to figure out what's in them. Don't throw away any dressing materials. Don't throw away anything that's expired. Keep it. You never know. You may have cause to use it later on. And like I say, dry canning, I think, is a great way of making bandages. It's what we used to do at the beginning of the 20th century when we were nurses. We also, we also used to make face masks. And this is kind of handy that way. All of that knowledge was just about dead when I started nursing in 1984, but was still available to me at the time. And I think it's really, really key that you look at old engineering books, old gardening books, old nursing books, old veterinary books, 
because if we do lose the trappings of modern society, those sorts of skills are absolutely what we will need to use. Toodles. This was a 2021 Prepper Dog production. Oh. <laughs>